Well, good morning. Chatzquex, Pesia, Dr. Suisum, Chat, Louis Quex, Kisu Quicknum, Oxmachnik, Kotlik, Kawaska, Klausla. Good morning, everybody. My name is Standing Grizzly Bear. Uh, my my Suyapi name or my English name is Mike Derglo. And thank you, Natalie, and thank you, CMP. Uh, as uh, Dana said, I've been with the CMP for quite a while, not since it started, like uh, Mary shared yesterday, but quite a while. And I feel like over the years, we've we've really became a, more of a family working together and, and collaborating. Uh, as, as you said earlier, today's focus is going to be on impacts. And um, thank you, John and Mark and Mike, for being on this, this amazing panel to talk about impacts to cultural resources today. Uh, I've, um, I've been working for the tribe for almost 40 years. And uh, quite a few years, I, I was a game warden and I was on tribal council for a little bit. And then I went to uh, the natural resources department for most of my career in uh, water quality. And I was the environmental director there. And then about six years ago, I moved here to the, the uh, tribal historic preservation department. And in that, you know, in that transition, um, I really felt like, um, you know, or, or had a better understanding of the natural resources uh, being cultural resources. They're one and the same. So in my, in my other life or in my other job, protecting the, the natural resources, uh, moving to pre preservation is no different than it was before. And there was several people yesterday that shared, uh, you know, it, it just seems like the, the people that are coming here are much different than they were, say, 20 years ago. Uh, and I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what that is, but uh, I know just being in this just job, I've noticed that there, there seems to be a lot more um, impacts uh, on, on our cultural resources, maybe just because I'm seeing them more, but I, you know, I'm just not sure. Uh, so um, we're going to do this panel a little bit different than the ones yesterday. I'm going to have uh, John go first, and he's going to introduce himself, and then he's going to uh, speak for probably 15, 20 minutes, and then um, Mike will go, and then Mark. So John Murray, take it away. Intertribal. Intertribal, John. You're on mute. Okay, uh, good morning. <laughs> I was, um, he was calling for an inner tribal. That's, that's a, a powwow, a modern uh, pan Indianistic um, celebrations where they call all the tribes to, to dance. But my response was tribalism in a way has um, really gotten away from all the way up to, to presidential politics. And so, but anyway, uh, my name is John Murray. Uh, I work in, as the historic preservation officer for the Blackfeet tribe. And uh, I used to be a, uh, work in a, uh, as a, uh, college teacher for, for many years. In my younger days, I was a electrical contractor. I had gone to college for engineering technology and then one day I just quit it and never did it again. And I went back to school and studied philosophy, education. And so when the Blackfeet Community College uh, I, I was working at um, Montana State at Bozeman, and then I was um, we were a visiting scholar at one point at uh, Oklahoma State University in, in Stillwater. 
Oklahoma. And then uh, I moved over to college and I was teaching at the community college. Um, actually was administering a grant, a bridge grant from Montana State University. And then my wife became president at college and, uh, and she created Blackfoot Studies. And she said, well, John's gonna teach it. He has all the rights to teach it. So, so I did that for a number of years. I actually did it eight years for pro bono at one point. And, uh, and then uh, I moved over here to the Tribal Historic Preservation Office. And I've been here for uh, doing this work for 19 years. And uh, I was, um, I wrote this program uh, for the tribe because I know uh, Mike uh, Munoz is, is on, on this. And I had walked into the tribal uh, uh, chambers and uh, there was all these people there that were uh, from the Forest Service. So they were gonna walk out to the wild. So I went with them that day. Uh, there was a while they were going to the well site and the Badger proposed well site and the Badger Two Medicine. And um, it had been on moratorium, but there was a lawsuit filed and, and uh, so we walked out there and, and, and uh, they said, with this coming back up again? And they said, yeah, big time. So on the way back in, uh, the archeologist told me, John, we wrote a letter to the tribal council, give them 30 days to respond. And uh, we we're going to, approved a notice to proceed. They already have an application to drill. So while they didn't much time, and they said, yeah, but they only got 22 days left. And so I got involved in, in, on a voluntary basis. And, and I seen an opportunity to write this Tribal Historic uh, Preservation Office, whereas I could draw an income and, and still work on, on the Badger. So I've been here for 19 years. We have been, uh, we, we uh, originally got started in the Badger Two Medicine, uh, and we got a, uh, uh, some money to do a traditional line use uh, assessment. So I named, I named picked the principal investigator, Dr. Maria Cedeno, the University of Arizona. And, uh, and I wanted to, to build a long time relationship with her, with the Office of the Bureau of Applied Research and Anthropology. Um, and uh, she said, what is it you want to do? I said, well, all these, a lot of these features, the traditional cultural properties in Montana, you know, even the, in the Dakotas and Wyoming, uh, Milk River uh, and, and Alberta and Saskatchewan, they seem to be consistent. And uh, we think they belong to us. And so as a Blackfoot people, um, uh, according to our stories. And, and so I, I said, well, we would like to, to move closer to the, <clears throat> that assertion, possibly proven scientifically. So, so we've been working together, cumulative research for 18 years. And um, she's got some, Dr. Zadino has been doing research. Right now I'm kind of, kind of sworn to a, maybe a, like a, a gentleman's agreement to like a non-disclosure agreement, not to reveal any of the research until it's published. But I, I just want to let you know now that it's going to be, it's going to be some, uh, groundbreaking findings. So <clears throat> I used to also work as a wildland firefighter. I used to be a, a type one hotshot crew superintendent. And then later worked in the national overhead teams as an operations section chief. And, uh, and I just got kind of well, too much longevity on my, my visit here to earth that uh, I had to give it up, you know. And, uh, just get too old. So also I, uh, I do a little bit of uh, uh, 
I have a little cow calf operation, about 120 head of cows. And, you know, we're calving right now. I think, thank God I've got uh, some grandkids, you know. And <clears throat> so, uh, so I, you know, I, I think we can actually be talking here about recreation, the impacts on cultural resources. And so, you know, I'm not out on the ground, but uh, I'm still, there's some gray areas into. And yesterday during a practice session, I was trying to get a feel for, for what I'd be talking about. And so Crown of the Continent to me would, you know, we put out a video years ago called Backbone of the World. Um, and that was in, in defense of the Badger Two Medicine. And, and also, uh, um, so I guess we could call it, you know, the Crown of the Continent is probably the same thing. But um, <clears throat> we have been in the area, you know, we have proven in this area that uh, through science, uh, literature reviews, and oral histories, uh, uh, ancient stories, uh, diagnostic material through time, that we have been in this area, most of Montana, for, for a long, long time. And, and the, uh, the story that I heard, uh, you know, the 1851 treaty, the Port Laramie Treaty, uh, the uh, we were not there, the Blackfeet were not there, but the negotiations that came out of that 1851 treaty, a map was put together by Father D. Schmidt. And that crude map, uh, we kind of sort of transposed that over, you know, roughly onto the Montana and Wyoming map. <clears throat> so all of Yellowstone was Blackfoot territory, um, including over to the Clark Fork, down toward uh, Jackson, not Jackson Hole, but Cody, Cody, Wyoming. Jackson Hole, Wyoming too. Um, and also uh, we, uh, the, the, the story I heard happened south of uh, uh, Livingston on the Yellowstone River, where our creator, uh, we call Napi, he created this land, the animals, and, you know, everything that was in it, um, that runs along the southern boundary of the Yellowstone River to where it drops into the Missouri right in North Dakota. Then it sort of runs northeast toward, uh, toward Lake Winnipeg and it connects up with the North Saskatchewan River and back west to the mountains and into the mountains. And it comes down the mountain front then it, and then it sort of uh, it right south of Chief Mountain uh, a ways uh, it goes over into the Cowspell area and then down through Seeley Lake, back down into the uh, uh, Yellowstone. And so we're using, you know, this uh, research. Uh, we have um, been in this area for, or right now, you know, through diagnostic material through time, we, we're, we're the latest thing we're down to about 13,000 years in the presence. Uh, we know it's longer because of what's going, what's going happening at Wally's Beach, just south of uh, you know, the, the archaeological site, uh, just south of, the, or just north of the border. Uh, but uh, so we've kind of been in the area for a long time. Uh, a few years ago, the Montana created a, uh, a new constitution in the, in the early 70s. And there was a line item in there that was called Indian education for all. However, there was never a dollar put into it until the governor, Brian Schweitzer, uh, put some money into it. And, and, and uh, so each tribe uh, uh, would to do a project. And so most of them did their history, except for Northern Cheyenne who did a, a language, uh, a Cheyenne language uh, project. And so my wife was 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 designated to do the one for Blackfoot people, and she mostly did hers in regard to land and loss of land, and uh, and the history. But a lot of these, um, so you know, and, and they had a year to do this, 
there wasn't much money. The projects were, were, you know, kind of low budget projects, you know. And so, so they went back to the legislature, Montana State Legislature to, uh, um, I better keep track of my time here. So I went back to, to the legislature to uh, see, if, you know, kind of present their, their findings and then also to maybe ask them for some more money, continue it. They never got any more money actually, but, uh, uh, but they did reveal their history. So I drove my wife there. I was able to get in that closed session. And my, 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 my premise, I guess, to, to do that was that I could hear their in raw material, raw, you know, the raw uh, dialogue. I don't know. So the Sioux came from, a, they said they came from a, the people in Fort Peck, Fort Belknap, they came from a valley in Ohio. The people in Rocky Point, they revealed that they came from Ontario and Wisconsin. The, the uh, Arapaho, they had come from, or well, uh, the Grovons had, the Arapaho speaking tribe had come from the South. Cheyennes were a little bit South. And so, uh, and, the, and the Salish, uh, there, there was, um, they came from the coast with an argument that started up from, from the geese. And they split off. There were 27 dialects that moved in for inland. And the Blackfeet said, no, we've always been here. Um, and so <clears throat> some of this research that you're going to be seeing is going to, going to be proving some of that. Um, I, I, again, I, I'm not, can't reveal that. But so, so we've been in this, this, this country a long time. And I heard, you know, a little while ago talking about management. And I'm not really sure who's charged with that, uh, what authorities you have or whatever, or if it's just uh, advisement or whatever. But uh, we have a presence right now in Badger Two Medicine, like I say, in like somewhere around about 13,000 years. And we're still going down diagnostically through time. So, <clears throat> so we've managed that area for that long. Um, and then uh, now I hear people talking about writing a management plan. And I'm like, well, no, it's gonna, they're gonna probably gonna crumble, you know. But just like some of the research we did with, like um, with, with some of the research that was done here by uh, uh, Chris Roos, a fire archeologist who talking about the buffalo and the way we manage buffalo. Uh, is if we don't reintroduce fire into the buffalo regime, it's, it, there's a tendency that it could collapse. So, so I, don't, I think I don't think we always have the right uh, uh, solutions when we start writing these management plans. But right now we're looking at. Uh, I'm consulting with with people, uh, and I really haven't answered it because uh, they want to use helicopters over the mountains um, and view. So this idea of conservation uh, uh, is really not working for the Blackfoot people, uh, actually in the park system. Well, I, well, yeah, basically the park system, because when I went down to Yellowstone, you know, uh, there was these, this little gal behind me with like right on my bumper, you know, um, more or less kind of like body language or vehicle language, you know, that, hey, you're going too slow and I'm about five miles over the limit. Uh, you know, and all the cars behind her. I could have been on the 105 in Los Angeles, you know. So <clears throat> this, um, the, the, um, the park, you know, was more, uh, I guess, from my perspective here in consulting, most consultant about different projects, all those projects that are going on in the park, um, get great big old, you know, stuff I'm supposed to read, you know, it's like stacked on my desk, you know, I mean, there's no way I could conceivably read that in probably a year, you know. So I just kind of thumb through it like a tribal council, like that, you know, and then put it onto the shelf. Uh, so, uh, but conservation itself is, is not working because some of the areas that we've used is not, they're not, they're unresponsive to us in, in the park system. And, and so, you know, we've also, 
uh, I, I, I don't really have the solutions uh, uh, to keep the waters clean in perpetuity. When I was a kid, we used to ride horses all over. Uh, and we'd get down on all fours and drink water out of the streams. The, <clears throat> in the plant communities, uh, you know, uh, we have all kinds of people that, uh, you know, they do this uh, uh, medicinal type things with plants and herbs and weeds even. Um, and they, uh, they, they use them medicinally by their ingredients. But in the Blackfoot worldview, sometimes you, we, we get the gift, the people get the gifts from nature itself and creation. And, and they mix those things with, with, with their, uh, a gift, a big ceremonial gift. And then it, it uh, is used. And so those, those are not revealed. Sometimes they'll kind of reveal them on their moccasins or they'll put them onto their, onto their regalia or their, their, their clothing uh, <clears throat> as their power. For instance, myself, I, I had uh, uh, hyperactive thyroid. And a friend of mine was, uh, name is Apamachka. He was, uh, we were co-teaching at the Blackfeet Community College. <clears throat> so I went to Great Falls, they wanted to give me radioactive iodine and killed my thyroid. And uh, they say I couldn't be around my family for a couple of weeks because I'd be radioactive, you know. And so I, I, I said, well, hey, I don't want to do that. So I was telling my friend up on my guts. He took me over to his mom in, in Brockett, Alberta. And she made me this tea. And she said, it's already taken care of you, you know, just drink it. And then she said in Blackfoot, you know, go get a second opinion. So I went back to the doctor and they did some more tests and it's been, it was normal. And it's been normal for 25 years. And so, you know, those types of people, those types of plant communities, they're not gonna be revealed to the crowd managers or, or the park people, or even sometimes even their family. Um, and, there, and there are traditional laws and rules that govern that. Um, so, so it plants, and then also <clears throat> um, when, when you're looking at the Bulletin 38 um, here in the States, uh, uh, Bulletin 38 and National Park Service uh, is the uh, identifying traditional cultural properties. And so most of the time under Criterion D, uh, which is evidence or, or, or features on the ground, and that's all people look for. And so, there, but there are other, other areas, localities uh, that, that are sacred to the people and, and they're not really gonna reveal those, you know. Um, sometimes they do in a, sort of in a vast area. Uh, and one of those would be the Badger Two Medicine. So um, the other thing too is like drones. Um, in the future, we don't know where they're gonna go. I see where now you could, uh, where two people can sit on a drone and, and go fly around, you know? And so maybe in the future, we'll have all these little shops with, you could rent these drones to go fly over the crown of the continent. You know? uh, so it seems to me like, like uh, the conservation or the idea of, of the park is really geared toward the tourism. Like, uh, maybe managing the way the tourists come because they pay some taxes, you know, and, uh, and so therefore they have a right to the land. So it's, um, and I don't really understand the impacts, but let me tell you this, uh, uh, in the area around St. Mary's Lake, Dr. Briney, Dr. Barney Reeves, Brian Reeves, uh, Professor Emeritus University of Alberta, conducted several studies in the area and, and it took a number of years to complete. And, uh, and so he found a cultural marker up there too. And so it, they, he basically, his findings was that those were Blackfoot sites that go beyond 10,000 years and some under 10,000 years. 
and some maybe under 10 years. <laughs> you know, we're an ongoing culture. We didn't, we can't just freeze frame ourselves way back there and protect that portion. We, we're, we're moving into the future. Uh, a living, uh, vibrant Blackfoot worldview. So those areas up there are being dismantled by tourists. They're putting up there like John plus Mary with a heart around it, maybe scratch it onto a rock. Uh, Kilroy was here or whatever, you know. I don't know. And so, you know, they're, they're basically uh, destroying those sites. And so what, what are solutions? I, I really don't know. I, I, well, we've talked around, uh, I've talked with Mark Bodley several times, you know, and we, we've talked about education. And yesterday we even talked about Immanuel Kant's uh, categorical imperative, you know, uh, philosophically, <laughs> where, you know, everybody has this innate uh, moral obligation. But I don't think everybody's got that anymore. I, I, I think everybody has it, but they've, in tribalism, other ways, you know, uh, they, they, they've sort of individual building blocks in America, you know, like uh, taxes, individuality, property, and all these kind of ideas. Uh, they sort of, sort of left those notions of being a human being. So, so I'm not really sure, but education, uh, and, uh, and I have a graduate degree in education, but um, but it, it's not writing, you know, like pamphlets for, to protect cultural resources, you know. So I, I, I think we could call on the, on the people that are watching, I think what we got like 24 or 50 people or something. Um, and then those, those people call that are called the, uh, you know, Crown of the continent. Maybe they could work with with Mark, who is has a lot of Mark Bodley has a lot of uh, Mike Munoz. They have a lot of jurisdiction on on, on some of the mountains, and the Rocky Mountains, and, and then maybe some of the people from the Park Service uh, can collaborate on on language. Uh, I, I, I don't have much input, but I'd be willing to help. So I think I, I'm probably out of time. So um, the uh, pretty close, John. You're all right. Though. I'm still okay. All right. So, um, but I just want want to say that our our worldview will maybe close with the way our worldview, you know, uh, where it's a land based uh, knowledge. Uh, it's a land-based language and, and our culture is still intact. Uh, there was this national organization that contacted a friend of mine, Tyson Rainwald. And, and they identified, they identified uh, and they want to help cultures around the world. They identified five that are still intact. And, and there, was, there was one in New Zealand, the Amazon, one in Russia, um, there was one, um, I forget where the fourth one was, but the fifth one was the Blackfoot people. And so our, 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 um, our ways are still intact. Um, though they're in fragile condition, um, we, there's, there's this renaissance or maybe reflowering of it uh, uh, started happening uh, a few years ago. And so the way we, that we, we interact with, with the world uh, uh, is different than, than, than Western, uh, Western worldview. And a lot of times we have uh, you know, consultation and that's basically what my office does. Uh, well, we do all kinds of things, but that's what we're charged, funded for. So, so we always have these problems where you know, people come and, and they, uh, they want to consult. They meet the Secretary of the Interior's minimum standards as a principal investigator. And so we start trying to, to tell them about things. And then they try to frame it back into the Western located static worldview. And it becomes a problem. Um, so 
So we start trying to do our own research, you know. Um, however, we haven't really gained a foothold uh, in, in, on the national level or even the Montana level. But we would like to probably be able to just get some of the land back, you know, give it back to us, uh, to surpluses or whatever. You know. uh, we have a lot to offer the world, humanity, humanity itself. You know. uh, and, and so our, you know, our culture is, is, is dependent upon the land and protection of the land. So if we focused on badger to medicine, we have treaty rights there. Um, so I made this comment that the, um, if you don't really understand or you can fathom in your mind uh, by how we lost the land or why we lost the land or whatever, you know, uh, you know just turn on the television and see what Russia is doing to the Ukraine. Eventually, they'll get them into a treaty. And they'll appoint this puppet uh, dictator. But the only difference is with us, they would appoint an Indian agent. And so we still have that connection to the land. And, uh, and then people come to us and they want us to to uh, kind of maybe rubber stamp some of their ideas, uh, rubber stamp their management plans or whatever, or, uh, or they'll listen to us and then write it up uh, and it doesn't fit. And, and so we, it's, it's a very difficult situation. Um, I know all tribes, uh, well, let, let me say this in closing. As a, as a tribal historic preservation officer, we've traveled all over in the last, well, I've been here eight, 19 years, eight, I think 18 as a typical. And uh, so we went to a lot of meetings in different parts of the country. And um, we've gone to, to tribes where the only thing left of their culture is, is uh, like, uh, something like this here, like a, a sweetgrass braid and a cigarette lighter. And then, um, and so it's sad, you know, it saddens me that they've lost their culture. And, and so we as blood, uh, we as Blackfoot, uh, we uh, in the Confederacy, the Blackfoot tribe, uh, the Blackfoot people, six Akechic people, the, the North Pekani, South, South Pekani, the Bloods, and, the, and Six Ika. We're trying to make a, um, an effort to, to maintain, you know, stimulate, and protect our culture forever. And so with that closing remark, I'd like to just say that uh, thank you for, for including me. Um, hope you include me in the future. Thank you, John. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so next is Mike of Oka. But one of the things that we talked about and John mentioned that we talked about yesterday is possibly getting together to develop some educational materials around cultural awareness. I know one thing that my office does here uh, is provide cultural awareness training for different agencies. We've done it for Montana Power, we've done it for BPA, we've done it for several different, uh, the Montana Department of Transportation so we talked yesterday, and, and Mark, maybe you, you can kind of keep us down, going down that path. I know Mark checked out a couple of websites, and he can talk about this more, but there was not really any, any information, educational information uh, for people to look at. Uh, for instance, if you're going into Glacier Park, if there's a website, and you can click on cultural awareness, 
that's that's one of the things we talked about yesterday. So thank you, John and Mike. Take it away, Inner Tribal. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, John, for the prayer this morning. It felt really good. Um, my name is Mike Oka. Our name Oka is loosely translated into English from Oka. Oka means the Sundance Lodge Keeper. And when people were forced to take uh, surnames, individual names, it became Oka through translation. And it's been that way since. Um, I was raised by my grandparents before I was before I was old enough to go to school. So my first language was Blackfoot. Everything was spoken in Blackfoot. I heard the stories in Blackfoot on my mother's parents' side was Aloysius Crop-Haired Wolf. Her mother was uh, Apuyaki, Teresa Smallface. She was born in Browning, Montana. And uh, her mother died giving birth to another child. She was two years old at the time. Her uncle, Emil Smallface, had to hitch up the wagon, drive it down to Browning, and he brought back my grandmother and her aunt, Isikowasi. Now I don't know her uh, English name. So my grandmother did not know her parents. And it was just through storytelling that uh, we retraced some of that. On my father's side is uh, Mukakin, Pat Weaselhead. His mother was uh, Mary Spearson, CP Nikki from Browning, Heart Butte area and uh, Pace was his father. They were adopted into Canada. He was adopted by Jack Weaselhead. That's how he got Weaselhead. His brothers were adopted into Big Throat families. Harry Big Throat, Jim Big Throat. They had an older sister, her name was Fanny. And uh, yeah, that's a little bit about who and where I come from, my grandmother was Esther Russell. She come from the Russell side of the family, which traces back to the Yellowstone Small Robes clan. And originally we're one people, all of all the Confederacy members were one people. And the land could not sustain those kind of numbers. So everyone broke out into clans, many more, and uh, went about in, into, different directions. One of the stories that uh, I heard when I was very young was that we were in the North Country, Slave Lake areas, uh, Peace River regions for nearly 800 years. So the question was why? Why were the people up in that area? And it took me from that time when I was six years old to three years ago to hear actually what happened was a volcanic eruption. And through history uh, in creating the hit smashed in Buffalo jump, it was proven that there was no use of that Buffalo jump for nearly 800 years. The same with the stampede site in uh, Cypress Hills. Another story was that uh, the Cypress Hills, the Sweet Pine Hills, which are more popularly known as the Sweetgrass Hills and the Porcupine Tail Hills were all created at the same time. And again, that was proven to be true in the late forties through geologists that had conducted a lot of the work. So our history is long. And uh, one story that I was told while I was, used to work for an individual in Yellowstone, or not Yellowstone, Crow Agency, Montana, Jigs Yellowtail. And uh, we had went to visit uh, another friend, Franklin Plentycoop, right in Crow. When we arrived there, the old man was getting ready to sweat. And I had never sweat with uh, anybody outside of our, our people at the time. And I didn't wanna be seen as a, a, a chicken or scared of 
what they were doing. So I agreed, okay, we'll go in, sweat with you. And after the sweat, we gathered for a feast. The old man came, sat, sat across from me at a picnic table. And he told me, you know, you people are really bad. You're really bad people. I sat there, I listened. I was at his table eating his food and I had no right to, to get into an argument. So I politely sat there and listened to him. He said, you people came from the North, the North country and you marched down, took over the land. We're up, meaning the crew were up in this area and we drove them all to where, all the way to where they were situated at the time. He said, you killed women, children, old people, everybody that was in front of you. When people heard the black feet are coming, they moved away. They cleared out, opened up the land. You just took it over. So that was one story I had to remember that. And as soon as I came back home after that summer job, breaking horses and working cattle for a jig's yellowtail, I went straight to my grandfather. First stop, Mukaki, Grandpa, this is what this man is saying from Crow Agents. He said, yeah, it's true. But that happened so long ago that we don't hardly talk about it anymore. Only a few people remember those days. Now, I guess that's where time immemorial fits in. But a lot of the people that I grew up around, um, Adam Delaney, Mamiukaki, Wathoksikinakim, Wilton Goodstriker, Akasikapiutaki, Many Gray Horses, uh, Pita, Pita Spitawa, Steve Oka, and others that told the story of our people going back in time. They all told the same story and they would reference the people they heard this story from. And through that, we could tell, while well, this individual was really honest, he was, he'd really tell good stories and accurate stories, referencing them. And one of the stories was that uh, when the creator put us on this land, just put us there, turned us loose. We did not have a language at the time. We only made noises, guttural noises, no way to communicate, in, you know, a way to communicate with one another, have plans, anything like that. That went on for so long. We don't know how long. Then creator came back to see how well his creation were doing. We had not advanced. In those years, it was said we'd lived for 500 years. So creator rounded up the people and took away 400 years of life, left the people with 100 years to live. Gave us language and smudge, sapatsuma. So through that smudge, and through the language, our people evolved from that. That's why our people were really spiritual. Need sit up peace and the individual. It's up to the individual to do right from wrong. Because there's always a higher power watching. Make an offering before you cross a river. Make an offering before you harvest your berries, your medicines. You're hunting. Everything was making an offering back to creation, to Mother Earth. The natural energies of a forest as you went through, we did try very hard not to disrupt that energy so we could be successful in hunting. A story of how Chief Mountain walked out to the front of the mountain range. I totally forgot about that story for, for so long until an old guy from the north, we were doing some work on the, uh, along the Red Deer River. And he asked me, do you still remember that story? 
that's told by your people of how Chief Mountain walked up to the front. And I told him, I, I, I forgot the story, but I'm going to think about it. So I began the thought process. And it took me a long time to remember portions of, portions of that story. And later on in life, going to uh, physical geology, physical geography classes at the University of Lethbridge, it was brought to my attention there was a Lewis overthrust. There's a phenomenon that happened along the mountains. And it showed that actually Chief Mountain moved to the front of the mountain range. How long ago was that? 72 million years ago, 52 million years ago. We don't know exactly how long. Now, these stories of how those hills were created around the same time all ties in. And that kind of reflects how long our history has been in these areas. I work as a consultation coordinator for the Blood Tribe. We work together with uh, Sikshika and Pikani, Hapatasu Pikani. We're hoping to get Amskapi uh, Pikani involved on the Canadian side so they had a right to be and were present in these areas for who knows how long. So those sites that we're finding, who is going to say they don't belong to um, Scott Picani? That's the importance of it. Teepee rings. How old is a teepee ring? We have a rough guess of how long it's been there by examining the depth of the stone. The little traces of uh, fungus that's growing on there. Black is the oldest. So we'd say if we dug up a good sized stone and measure eight inches into the ground, it's a rough guess, really rough guess, but it's, it's nearly 800 years old. In Canada, we're funded through the Alberta government and uh, Alberta consultation office to be able to go out and do these sorts of things. Whenever there's activity within our traditional territory, and that again is another difficult portion of what we do. So we know our traditional territory, Alberta government will go by treaty territory, which is ridiculous. When we go out on a site, we have to reference the nearest uh, sacred site. We did some work near the Majorville Medicine Wheel area, as, as it's known to the Bloods, and uh, found over 50 stone features. In the historical resources uh, database, only two sites were recorded in that area. So we get to do traditional land use assessments, TEK, traditional ecological assessments on unoccupied crown lands. The last vast areas that we have today are the Eastern slopes. So the eastern slopes run from, run in the Cruz Nest Pass area, north and south. We know the area as Panikta. Uh, the TP liners of the Rocky Mountains. We have been in there, we've encountered uh, grazing lease associations, guiding outfits, forestry, oil and gas activity, which locked their gates so our hunters can't access those lands. And we're left with a very, very minute portion of where we used to be able to go. That area was opened up for recreational use several years ago from people going to the North country. 
the Ghost and Waprius areas in Northern Alberta. That was shut down because there was too much environmental destruction happening through off-highway vehicles, uh, mud bogging, uh, people partying, drinking there, leaving burnt vehicles, destroyed campers, everything. And they're still trying to clean it up today. So everybody was shifted down into the, along the uh, Old Man River. And our elders used to take their children, grandchildren into these areas and teach them about nature different medicinal plants, sacred trees that we use for ceremony, different uh, berries, things of that nature. But now it's overcrowded and our elders are, are pushed out. So we speak a little bit about recreational use. Trails that are being developed in many areas. How will they impact a sacred site out there? Maybe it's a vision quest site. Maybe it is an area used for somebody mourning, a burial site, an area that might have been used for catching eagles. We don't know, but they're out there. We're now mitigating human remains that were found along the river, in the riverbank. Archaeologists want to take those, collect those bones, study them, rebury them. And we as Nichitapi are told, don't bother things like that. Don't bother it. Leave it alone. And that was our recommendation. It's an ongoing um, investigation now. But it's probably close to 15 feet beneath the surface of the ground. In our time, we did not bury people. It was a crevice. Maybe a body would be stuffed in there. Um, tree burial, scaffold burial. But we believe that the spirit could not move on into the spirit world if it was covered with dirt. So we did not bury our people. How do we continue? In the future, with this kind of activity, we're going to end up mitigating the linear footprint. We did a traditional land use assessment in Banff, Alberta, from Banff to Lake Louise. All on foot, we walked the entire distance, 68 kilometers up and down mountains, going through trails found some sites, but the biggest thing we encountered was garbage. Garbage, garbage everywhere. You couldn't step maybe five feet, five steps, and there's another piece of garbage. We picked up a lot, took them out with us, and that was the saddest thing. That was a federal park. And you can, we found evidence of poaching in those, in those lands. So how do we plan into the future? How do we control this better? We talked about uh, educating the people. Educating the people may or may not create more interest in going to these places, causing further destruction, disruption. If it's a sacred site, how can you prevent that spirit from taking flight? If it's bothered too much, that's the term we use when the spirit leaves that site. So maybe three generations down the road, and a young individual might want to go on a vision quest, go out to that site, fast for four days, no food, no water, and receive nothing because the spirit is gone. 
the connection from the heavens to Mother Earth and beyond. How do we keep it intact? How do we do that? It's very difficult. The little stories I told you, I shared with you today are just to give you some idea of our presence and how long we've been here all this time. And to fully understand who we are, one would have to learn our language. That is one way to know the meaning of what we're talking about. We talk about environment, but you have to include the individual into that environment, the people that belong to the environment. That is the missing factor within this equation. Taking that equation, that factor out of the equation, it leaves you with something that you cannot solve until you put that factor back into it. And we have to remember our ancestors. And now think seven generations ahead of you. So in this work I do, I receive a lot of information. Process it in my head. Back to my original language, break it down and repeat the words back to them as an answer in their language. It's difficult to do. Sometimes it takes some thought. But everything around that activity impacts another thing, the water the air, the land, the animals, right down to that blade of grass that's growing, all need water, the human beings especially. Clean water. Up here, the Bow River, the Waterton River, St. Mary's River, are polluted to the point where the cottonwoods are dying. We asked the old man, why are the cottonwoods dying? The reply is the water is sick. The berry brush is being impacted. The berries are disappearing too. So what do we do? How do we walk in harmony with mother nature? And how do we keep our history intact that's on the ground? We had an oral history. Oral history, however, we had petroglyphs. Things were written on stone, as Aaron and Brad know, and recorded that way. A lot of the people that we come from did not speak English at all. So when I was put in school, I had very little English. I was in trouble all the time because we were prevented and, and, and scolded and beaten if you were caught speaking your language. But I didn't know any other English. I didn't know, I didn't know much English. I was forced to learn it. And as a very young child, you really get fearful. I'm going to get a beaten again today. First light, when you get up, geez, I hate this. I'm going to get a beaten again today. I'm going to get strapped. I'm going to get whipped. These are the things that we had to go through. But we learned. We learned the language. Because we had to. So in order to fully understand the people and their connection to Mother Earth, the wildlife included everything, you have to learn the language. 
And I think that's what's missing in this equation. We really have to work together because when, prior to contact, these lands were in such pristine condition, so clean. The people only took what they needed and we still practice that. Just take what you need, no more. Leave an offering before you harvest anything. Put an offering back when you're done. Gathering berries, we don't, we're really taught not to break off the branches because in the future, those berries might not be there anymore. We swam in the rivers. We drank from the rivers. Everything was there. You could be out on the land. You could pick a root, eat it if you got hungry. If you're along the river, pick berries, eat those, drink water. Everything was there. Even certain willows, if you were not feeling well, you could peel the bark, lick the backside of that, and it was good. We did that. Now there's so many dams in place along these rivers where it's impacted the artesian wells, the springs that are out there on the prairie. Where are we going and why? Growth and development. Today, when we're trying to practice our treaty rights out on the lands that we have right to do, we're treated like immigrants, foreigners. What are you doing here? Why don't you Indians go back home? Go home, go back to the reservation. That's the language that's thrown at us. We've been met with uh, guiding outfits that have pulled firearms on us. That's crazy because they think those lands belong to them. But in the Indian way of thinking, you cannot own the land because that long will be there forever and you won't be there forever. So those are some of the things I'll talk about today. I hear my granddaughter is up and about. I'm working from home and on annual leave, but I was really happy to uh, jump onto this meeting. And I hope we learned a little bit today. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day. Thank you, Mike. Very much appreciated. And uh, <clears throat> Mike and John told me that uh, questions, if you have a question, those are $10 and answers are $20. So just so you know, before you start asking questions, I'm just letting you know that. You gotta go to the casino, right, Mike? Thanks, Mike. Hey, uh, you got thank you. <laughs> so Mark is next and, uh, and we'll have a, a little bit of time for questions after Mark's done. Mark, go ahead, take it away, intertribal. You're muted, Mark. You're on, yep. And I laugh when other people do that. I do the same thing. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Uh, Mike, I'm gonna depend on you to cut me off uh, so I don't go and take up the time for the question and answers on the end. So can you please uh, give me a, a few minutes warning? Do that for me, please. Thank you. Um, brothers and sisters, and because I view you all as my brothers and sisters, I am honored to be interacting and talking with you. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, first, I noticed that Mike Durglow and John Murray are wearing their hats. I don't know why they're wearing their hats, but I'll tell you the reason why I am. I can't keep control of my messy hair. In a few years, I'm going to completely look like Brad Tucker. <laughs> My wife told, told me, though, that uh, uh, she finds baldness attractive, so I'm heading down the right road. <laughs> um, so 
I am Mark Bodily. I am more than just a name than a title. First and foremost, who I am is, you can see on the background, a little bit of mess on the walls. Those are pictures of my kids, notes and drawings of my kids. And I'm a family man. I have five children that range between the ages of 22 and nine. Uh, two boys, two girls, and uh, my wife. Um, so first and foremost, that's how I like to connect to people is we are human beings. We are our brothers and sisters, and we need to show respect and love and kindness and understanding to other people. Um, I'm going to share a PowerPoint presentation here that I'd like uh, you all to pay attention to. I'm going to make uh, four key points that I want you to take away. And at the end, there is uh, an invitation for a call to action for each and every one of us individually and in our roles uh, as managers, users, and stewards of the land. I have utmost respect for uh, Mike Durglow, John Murray, Mike Oka and other tribal members that I've worked with. And I send out a personal plea to please listen to them, please involve them. And uh, all that will come out of that is good. All right, I'm gonna share my presentation here real quick. Oops, hold on a second. I have to click this button first. <laughs> so I'm going to click share my screen. And then, Natalie, can you share that? Oh, so what we are seeing is your desktop. So if you pull up the PowerPoint, then, yep, I see you're clicking on it. Um, do you have dual mod? Oh, so we're looking at your notes. Yep. And then just swap. Perfect. Yep. All right. Let me just check. Okay. So I introduced myself personally, uh, but my work titles are forest archaeologist, heritage program manager, forest tribal liaison for the Helena Lewis and Clark National Forest. So we only manage a, a portion of uh, the crown of the continent, just south of Glacier National Park, east of the Divide, west of the Blackfeet Nation, all the way down towards and past Helena. Uh, so we do cover a large area. The Flathead National Forest is uh, the other manager on the west side of, of the Divide. So in addition to those titles, I want to to make it clear to you guys that I am not a decision maker. I am for, for this agency. I am an advisor to the decision makers. And I also view myself as an educator, educating my coworkers, my leadership, other people that I interact with. Um, and you'll see that next line. I put it in all caps. And this is a little bit in response to a comment John Murray made at the beginning. I am not that archeologist that told them, you guys have 32 days, now down to 22 days to provide input and we're going to approve oil and gas drilling in the Badger 2 medicine area. That was way before my time, but I wanted to make it sure that was clear it was not me. <laughs> um, but it has more meaning than I am not that archaeologist and I don't want to be that archaeologist. And what I mean by that is I don't want to study cultures as an anthropologist, living cultures as an anthropologist or uh, uh, past cultures as an archaeologist. And I don't want to study those or promote those at the expense of living cultures. Um, I my personal philosophy and my professional philosophy is yes, it is important to uh, study these, uh, these cultures, but again, not at the expense, rather for the benefit of living cultures and future cultures, all cultures, not just uh, the one that I've been raised in. So my background and training in cultural resources is from a Western science perspective. I 
attended two different universities and obtained my master's degree in anthropology with a special emphasis in archaeology. One of the things that I've learned most and foremost is that the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. Uh, it, I, I really struggle with other scientists who claim that they know everything because there's no way that that's possible. This life is a learning experience for all of us. So having said that, my understanding and interaction with the various tribes and their world, world views and cultural resources is still growing. Um, and I still expect it to grow. And again, the more that I learn, yes, I will learn more, but there's still a whole world out there for me to get closer to and understand. Something that I educate coworkers, leaders, other people is that tribal worldviews are just as valid as Western science worldviews and any other worldviews uh, across the world shared by people. Uh, having said that, I am in, in this presentation, I'm going to focus a little bit more or weigh a little bit more towards pre-contact cultural resources and, and share a little bit of that perspective uh, with you guys. So my first key takeaway point. You've heard from uh, the previous presenters from John, Mike, and Mike. Tribes are the original stewards of this land and maintain a deep connection to it, not just to the crown of the continent or, or the lands that my forest may manage, but all lands. I need to stress also that each tribe is different. That's why Mike Durglow is talking about intertribal. He's acknowledging that different tribes are different from each other. They have different stories, different knowledge, different cultures. And in this effort here, we're trying to share an intertribal message uh, because they do share some common approaches as uh, to the land. So you'll see highlighted here, some tribes, they come from and are directly tied to these lands, their knowledge, language, stories, culture, worldviews, identity and power and et cetera and et cetera come from these lands or are dependent on these lands or are directly tied to these lands. And honestly, I struggle with acknowledging that I'm an expert in all of this because I view for these types of resources, knowledge and expertise, the tribes have that information. They understand and they will share what they can with us um, in order to promote a good stewardship of, of these lands and resources. So again, here's my plea, is that the tribes must be involved in all stewardship decisions, activities involving these lands and areas, not only because it's a law in the United States, I, I don't know what the Canadian laws are. I hope that they're somewhat similar or have the similar purpose, but we need to do this not just because it is the law, but it is the right and moral thing to do. So key takeaway point is tribes are original stewards, maintain a deep connection, and we need to involve them. Moving on to the number two key takeaway point. Um, you'll see here pictures of some uh, tribal artifacts. Uh, as we call them in, in Western science. Tribes have different names and different meanings for those as well. Those you might be more familiar with. However, I want to point out that tribes have a broader definition or understanding of cultural resources. And I'll run through a couple of those um, uh, with you. I wanna share also that all the photos in this presentation are photos that I've taken and only one I got from the internet and I'll identify what that one is. So when we talk about cultural resources, maybe this is the first thing that pops into the general public's mind. Um, also other things, cairns, rock alignments, features, hunting blinds, not modern ones, this is a very old tribal fun. Stone circles that may be teepee rings or medicine wheels. I mean, there's many different meaning and uses of 
uh, stone circles, culturally modified trees. So those are some of the common ones that the general public, again, when you talk about cultural resources may automatically pop into their mind. But it is more than just that. You can see here bison, what meaning they have to not just the Blackfeet, but other tribes. And it's more meaning than just subsistence, going out and hunting them. Um, stories, uh, beliefs, everything su surrounds uh, animals and other cultural resources. These big uh, grizzly bear prints, those are the ones that I woke up to in the morning that circled my tent in 2016. <laughs> I respect those animals. <laughs> Plants, foods, medicines. So here are two uh, food sources, but also medicines and have other meanings. And you can see the camas illustration is the one that I got off the internet, but the full range of plants. There's also water, mineral, air. You've heard some of this from uh, the other presenters. There's also traditional use and travel corridors, landscapes, areas. And a little more abstract uh, is seasons, time, beliefs, story, language. All of these are dependent and tied to these lands that we're talking about. Okay, number three key takeaway point. Uh, since we're addressing recreational impacts, um, I'm going to address a few to some resources that maybe the more majority of the public are a little more familiar with. Um, but please, please, please recognize that there are many more types of impacts uh, that the tribes can share with you from their worldviews to all of these types of resources. And as Mike Dirtlow mentioned before, not just natural resources, but cultural resources, they're interconnected. It can be the same thing. So here um, is an interpretive sign. And so my question at the top is, what worldview does this uh, interpretive sign reflect? Can someone respond to that, please? Just go ahead and blurt it out, anybody who wants to. Colonizer. <laughs> yes, thank you. And we could put a lot of different titles to that worldview, but basically, you know, we share some, I, I'm gonna call this a Western science worldview here. And yes, we share some of the same interests as tribal worldviews and some of the management ends up being the same as tribal views, but there's a couple of things here. This one, this interpretive sign is talking about uh, the prehistoric rock art is a mystery legacy. Well, tribes know what kind of legacy that is. For us Western scientists, we want to figure that out. That's why we call it mysterious. Who were these artists? Well, tribes know who those artists are. Western science is trying to figure out who they are. What were the murals painted? What do the handprints and symbols mean? And on and on the different worldviews. So here's a commonality is, yeah, from Western science, these resources are very fragile. They, we don't want people touching them because it damages them and will damage the, the, the science that can be gotten from them. But it can also damage uh, the tribal worldviews. You'll notice in the lower right hand corner, there's an illustration of uh, a, a tri tribal member, an American Indian, standing on top of a horse painting these pictographs. Well, maybe in some areas that occurred. Well, some of this, uh, some of these rock art sites predate horses in the Americas that were brought in, or at least modern horse that was brought in by, by the, first by the Spanish. Anyway, so this is a good perspective of Western science, but look close at that. What do you also see? What do you see on this interpretive science? Someone blurt that out, please. Graffiti. Graffiti, yes. <laughs> this is gonna sound really weird to you, but I'm happy the graffiti is there on this sign and not on the rock art. Uh, I, I, when I saw this, I looked at the rock art very carefully and there wasn't the graffiti on there and I was so pleased and happy. 
but still it's not right to, to vandalize any of these things. Let's move to the next one. So what worldview does this reflect? Notice there's graffiti on this sign as well, although less than the previous sign. And I'll read it. When Blackfeet elder Willie Running Crane was just a boy, he learned of a sacred spot on the Sun River. Over 75 years later, he visited this site for the first time and told this story. And uh, it says, my uncle, old Running Crane, told of going south to get horses. His party was gone a long time. On their way back, they fought with another tribe. I don't know if that was the Salish or the Kootenai or who, but they fought with another tribe. Some of their group were killed and the horses were lost. Now the party had to walk. They slipped into the mountains to spend the night. At dawn, they awoke to see the rock wall above them was covered with red handprints, leaving that they were at a sacred spot, they prayed. So someone blurred out, what worldview does this interpretive sign reflect? I'm gonna hold my silence until someone says what worldview does this reflect? <laughs> All right, that was long enough to make you all feel uncomfortable. It's a tribal cultural worldview that's being reflected here. I am pleased that uh, previous archeologists or previous forest managers worked with the tribe, uh, specifically in the, on this one with the Blackfeet tribe to get two interpretive signs here at this area. And the reason why this site was chosen to be interpreted is it's right next to a road well known and a lot of people visit it but the two interpretive signs reflect the two world views okay here's two other things is so graffiti on rock art not only causes physical damage as you can see on the left hand side you can see people over the years have scratched in with another rock into some pictographs and yeah, from Western science perspective, that is causing damage to this that we do not want. But it is so much more than that from a tribal uh, worldview. And to illustrate this, I included the one on the lower right hand side. So this is a sign that says site of the first Masonic meeting in Montana, September 23rd, 1882. It's on top of Mullen Pass uh, near Helena. So you can see the bullet holes in that sign. And my question is, do you think this vandalism only has physical impact to local Masons? Absolutely not. Yes, physical impact, visual impact, a disappointment. But man, you talk to any Mason here that may see that and you're going to hear about the spiritual impacts, the feeling impacts, the frustration, everything else that goes along with it. Well, if we can understand that, we should also understand that graffiti on rock art or damage to tribal sites and et cetera are so much more than physical damage as well. So there's a story to go with this one. Um, so this is Hellgate pictographs and some graffiti was scratched over it. You can see the pictographs, they're a little faint, but they're under there. And you see a diamond shape. Um, scratch over the top. Well, that was in 2014. We're monitoring this site, trying to curb this again, right next to a road, happens to be in a place where people go to rock climb. We've worked with the rock climbing, local rock climbing club, and they no longer climb on this cliff face. They, they know not to, but it seems to be a fairly well-known spot or easily discovered. And in 2015, you can see scratched over there, and I'm gonna share here with you, a member of the public that knows about this site came to the local district ranger's office and reported this graffiti. They were very upset. The reason why I'm sharing that is because uh, to illustrate that many members of the public care about these types of resources and are, are good stewards and want to be good stewards if we can educate them properly, which you'll see at the end of my presentation. 
but the story here is, is 2015 is scratched in there and then Intermountain is scratched in there and then somebody scratched out Intermountain. <laughs> Well, this happened in 2015, very, very sad story. But uh, we, the forest put out in social media, trying to find out, get any clues for our law enforcement on who did this. And we actually had uh, a, a troubled youth from the Helena area uh, call in and report and said, yeah, my teacher from our troubled youth program took us up there and she scratched that in. Uh, it turned out to be true. She did admit to it, unfortunately. Um, I don't know why she did it, but she ended up paying $10,000 to the Forest Service. And with that $10,000, we worked with the tribes and hired an international rock art preservationist by the name of Johnny Lobster, who came and spent several days with us. And we had a... a, a Goodness sakes, Mike, you're going to have to help me out with her name. Uh, it, I just drew a blank. The current tipo for your office? Oh, Katie. Katie, yep. Katie yep. was there with us, and we worked on restoring this to disguise the graffiti. And very sad story. But again, this is more than just physical damage to Western science. This is significant damage and mean, to meaning and importance of these cultural resources. So yeah, some of the... Sorry, go ahead. Got about two more minutes. Okay, I'm gonna hurry then real quick. Some of the recreational impact is uh, unintentional. For example, here's an off-road two track through a stone circle up on in the Molan Pass area. Here's uh, 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 what used to be a road up and over the Stone Fort Pass, which most of us know as Lewis and Clark Pass. Uh, it's been decommissioned, but it's now been converted into a recreational trail. And this is a, a very old tribal uh, trail as well. To, and I'm going to slaughter the pronunciation of this, not intentionally, but Poka La Rishkit Trail or Road to the Buffalo Trail. Um, more than just what we're seeing here, again, I'm reiterating the different kinds of effects that uh, other recreational activities can cause to these special areas as well. Here's my number four and last key takeaway point, education. Education is key for minimizing those impacts. But I, I think we need to do more than just educate people that it's against the law to cause damage or impacts to these types of cultural resources. But it and more than just saying, don't touch this stuff or leave it there, I think it's important we need to educate on why. Why for Western science? Why for tribal worldviews? Why for other recreating public, public to protect and minimize these uh, uh, impacts? And I honestly believe that the majority of people, if we properly educate them, will become stewards along with us and Here's a, a, a sign that simply says, please don't damage this, the, this rock art, it's against the law. Well, why is it against the law? Uh, we need to educate the public of tribal meaning and connection to this area within appropriate parameters. We need to educate people on how they can get involved in historic preservation and stewardship. So there's the summary of the key takeaway points, but here's my call of action to each and every one of you is let's work with the tribes and get the appropriate cultural resource stewardship message out there. Many different ways to do it. You heard about pamphlets and you saw interpretive signs. Well, let's put it on our websites as well. Let's make uh, for the, and, and, and I'll take personal responsibility for starting to get this going, at least with my forest, where I have just a little bit of influence. On our websites, let's have a link or a, a place on there that jumps out and isn't hidden that says these cultural resources are important to many peoples, specifically in this area, to tribes. Here's how we need to manage them, here's why we need to manage and protect them. Put them on uh, trailhead kiosks, use QR codes, 
anything that you guys can come up with, let's get that message out there that these cultural resources are critically important, not for just the general public, but for the life ways of tribes. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Mike and I thank you for your attention. And I hope that this was helpful uh, for your own personal uh, education as well.